MOD owns 1% of the British mainland. Um, that's a big real estate, as you probably would expect. There's a lot of archaeology on that. We have 736 scheduled monuments, parts of 10 world heritage sites, six registered battlefields, and the list really goes on. We have an army to protect our national identity and, and culture, and cultural heritage, including this wonderful archaeology, is an important component of that. Barra Clump is the last surviving extant burial mound of a collection of about 20 to 30 um, that survives on this part of the east of Salisbury Plain. In the Neolithic land surface, um, there's a beaker ditch, there's an early Bronze Age burial mound, and then of course this fabulous Saxon cemetery. Badgers are doing a very good job of digging out all the material on this site. Because we've tried to exclude badgers very unsuccessfully over a number of years, and this costs the taxpayer money, we took the leap of faith to say, why don't we just actually preserved by record in this one instance. The way this came about though was, as the best ones do I suppose, it's purely by chance. Phone call from Dermot Walsh. June 2011 I was posted down as the med sergeant to one rifles which were deploying to Afghanistan and one of the first things uh, I noticed was we had a large amount of soldiers who were off sick. So I looked at why these guys were off sick, what had caused it. Um, and number were battle casualties, and because of their injuries, they couldn't do military training. So I put a proposal forward to the chain of command that we would run some form of program that, why it didn't involve military training, there would be some military connection. You know, it's one of these things that you think at the time, what a strange idea. But once we've done it for a bit, you think really it's probably quite obvious and from my point of view my ancestors as an archaeologist a lot of them were military think of Brigadier Mortimer Wheelers or Lieutenant General Pitt Rivers and, the, and, it's, a, and it's a huge uh, assemblage of people that have done this in the past the links between the military and archaeology are, are huge. There were certain aspects of archaeology that would benefit these individuals both in terms of their social skills, self-esteem and also in terms of building new skills that will be vital both for civilian life and maybe a crossover into their military environment. Um, I was on op tags in 2009 in Kenya training for Afghanistan and um, I was on a muck fob and fell down a hole. I just thought I'd damaged uh, muscles in my back and then 10 months later it transpired that I'd done a bit more when I collapsed and um, couldn't really walk properly. Um, I found out about Operation Nightingale when I was at Tedworth House, which is one of the recovery centres down in Bulford. Um, and I was asking about the history behind Tedworth House itself and I um, mentioned my interest in archaeology and was told about Operation Nightingale um, and well, here I am. I think I'm very lucky as my first dig to be here and getting the chance to do what I'm doing. I mean, the sec my first day I was on my own skeleton, which is you know, obviously fantastic. Um, and the opportunities that have been offered to me already after three days, I would never have got through my own sort of trying to find out about this. In 2012, Time Team, Channel 4's archeology span show, came and filmed an episode uh, at Barrow Clump, which was the uh, site that the soldiers were excavating for Operation Nightingale and it was a very successful program. I think what the director did very well was not focus on the injuries but really try and explore why archaeology was beneficial uh, for the soldiers um, and why it helped them recover uh, from you know pretty high stress uh, traumatic situations. That's a very positive example. I think some of the negative, if you want to call it that, press that Operation Nightingale has got is as I say where uh, newspapers in particular focus on the fact that these soldiers have uh, missing limbs or um, some other sort of physical visible injury which really isn't particularly relevant. A university who I will not mention, they had a go at me over what we were doing at Barrow Clump and basically we said how dare soldiers do this, what gives them the right, what qualifications do they have? My point though first of all that the key people in sight were qualified archaeologists. Richard Osgood is one of the leading military archaeologists in Britain. I am a qualified archaeologist. I belong to the IFA. I have a degree, I have a master's, I do my PhD. I have also got academic rigour. 
I don't need to make up archaeological projects. They've always got to be ones that I need as a heritage professional to be done. Um, so the bottom line is they have to be funded properly, and hence you've seen Wessex archaeology professionals here. They have to be excavated properly. They have to meet a pretty rigorous research design and strategy, and that's with environmental sampling. That's with beautiful sections cut, as the one you see behind me. And it's about doing good archaeology, correct archaeology, and in fact in many ways, avoiding the pun, groundbreaking archaeology. Every soldier here has been taught the basics in archaeology and taught at a standard that will put a lot of universities and a lot of field schools to shame. And this is one of the things we're determined to do. It wasn't just about the recovery element for the soldiers. Whatever we did, we had to make sure the archaeology was done correctly and to a high standard, probably higher than most sites. Why? Because we knew the people would turn their nose up and say, this is soldiers digging holes. All the materials conserved, it goes to a museum. There's a proper archiving strategy, um, proper photography. The fact that we're training people at the same time, I don't see a problem. I don't want archaeology done badly. Anyone can do that. It's got to be done properly. The purpose of Operation Nightingale is to give those who have been wounded um, in service of their country um, a whole range of things. It's almost unique in being able to have that team-based approach in the open air and being able to have people having a variable amount of engagement with it. So if they get tired or if they, get, they need just a bit of space on their own, they can leave the thing alone and wander off. But there's no pressure as well, because we're all injured uh, at varying degrees as well. You know, if we need to have a rest or a break, um, there's no problems with that. It fits broadly into the idea of recovery. So we're not doing rehabilitation here, although clearly with some of the physical activity, there is an element of that. This is more around a purposeful activity to get them back into the swing of of being a productive member of society. When I come across an endeavour like this and people engaging with it so readily and seeming to get an awful lot out of it, it piques my curiosity as a psychologist and a scientist. The challenge is to take what is a sort of multifaceted activity and try and figure out which bits of it are kind of you know, necessary and sufficient to produce the effect. There's been no formal evaluation of Op Nightingale in, in its medical terms. It was not set up as a medical uh, healing process or, or re rehabilitation process. Um, very deliberately, um, were we to do so, we would need to get um, ethical approval. It would be seen as a treatment. The scientist in me wants to go, yes, we need to do this. But if we were to do this properly, we would need to do some form of controlled experiment and have some people doing archaeology and some people not doing it or doing something else. Um, and that's not really somewhere I want to go um, at the moment. All we really know is that Operation Nightingale works and it works to help these guys, many of whom have been traumatised. The fact that they're soldiers in some ways is irrelevant. Anyone who has suffered trauma, as Operation Nightingale shows, can benefit from doing field archaeology. I think it's entirely possible that the ethos of Operation Nightingale can be extended to other groups. Um, and I'm thinking here about disadvantaged children, uh, offenders, um, drug users. I think the key here is that we're giving people purposeful activity. It is not simply activity for the sake of it. It's activity for, with a defined and obvious purpose in mind. We've talked a lot in Britain over the last 20 years about community archaeology and including people in archaeology, but to be honest, we haven't done it. If you look around here, we have got young people, we've got old people, we've got people disabled, we've got people from backgrounds that we could never hope to engage with. The soldiers we have, I would like to think, are the archaeologists of the future. Penny found it, so <laughs> it's like, you know. It's going to be gold plated sword in there. The Finds Whisperer. Finds <laughs> Whisperer. Uh, we're on patrol on 12th January 2004, escorting the Estonian bomb disposal team. Um, whereupon our vehicle, our Land Rover, was at the front of the convoy, four vehicles, and a vehicle born suicide bomber pulled out. Uh, pretty much drove into the side of our vehicle and detonated. It was obvious I wasn't going to get back to my civvy job. So. Uh, forklift driver in a brewery. Um, people can be written off. 
um, you have this perhaps a stereotype of the sort of person that perhaps the army is the only place that they can find employment. Um, and you look out here and you see just how, how big a misconception that is. I was like, well, what do I do now? I've got a life-changing injury. Um, so I went back to college whilst on sick leave, and that's all before I blinked, and I was at uni in my first year, so... I, I finished my course, had a week out just to relax and got up here. X, uh, e -X -E. If we could get these guys into schools, in the community groups around the country, spreading the news about archaeology and how beneficial it can be, and how important our culture and the way we understand our culture is. To me, that is where Operation Nightingale needs to know. You know, I, I've kind of had a minor experiment a few weeks ago with a, a class of year sixes. Who was this person? What, you know, what are these artefacts? And it was great to sort of watch them act as detectives, really. And I think, you know, if you can get a class of 11 year olds and something like this, that they're, you know, the, the beauty of it was they, they weren't on site and yet it just sparked something within them. Now it is time for us to put something back. And it could be just something very, very small, you know, working with schools, working with disadvantaged kids. And I think that's the way for us to engage back into our community. What, of course, um, is so positive about Operation Nightingale is that these soldiers have discovered that uh, the skills that they learn in the army these skills are transferable into areas of civilian life. And Operation Nightingale in particular has a number of, of quite remarkable success stories of soldiers who were deeply traumatized and have gone through this experience and have come out the other end with careers in archaeology. It's definitely made my mind up in the fact that this is definitely a career path I'm following now. There is elements of things I'd recognise from psychological science built into these activities which perhaps we wouldn't ordinarily look out for but which I might be wanting to teach clients. I love the fact that I can see people getting that same passion, that same thrill of finding stuff. Being the first person here to see um, um, a, a spearhead since the 6th century AD and it's that tangible link to your past um, that I find exciting and it's just great to see that the lads here do too. Where is archaeology moving in this country? The community archaeology seems to be a growth area. Who would best to lead that? Well, soldiers and service personnel are trained to, to do, do that. If they're also trained in archaeology, what better resource could there be than, than those young men and women?